Healthy Two, Healthy Living with uh, MCI. We're so glad that you guys could join us. Something new for this year that we are doing is that we'll be offering the speaker series um, every other month this year, six sessions, um, which is an increase from four from last year. I'm Jennifer McAllister. I'm with the Alzheimer's Association, the Wisconsin chapter, and I'm going to be uh, the moderator for today's session. We're so glad that you guys could join us, uh, helping on some of the back end things, the technology pieces. We have Bonnie Nuckinson from the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. And uh, Dr. Nate Chin is our medical director for the series. Dr. Chin, is there anything you'd like to say uh, before we get started to welcome people? Everyone, uh, no, really, I, I just want to thank you for, for coming today and attending virtually. And, and we're very excited about this, this first uh, discussion uh, on smoking cessation, which I think really speaks to a larger picture of risk factor modification and habits uh, and how the power that we have uh, in controlling many of the things that affect us later in life, particularly our brain. Uh, and this will be recorded as well, and we'll be able to share it uh, for those that are going to recommend it to others and, and want to tune in again. Uh, but thank you for, for attending, and I believe we'll have some questions or questionnaires at the end, uh, so please stay to the end too. Thank you uh, for that introduction and that welcome, Dr. Chen. If you haven't answered the question yet, uh, we have a poll that is out here for everybody. And uh, the question is, what part of the body does smoking affect? Um, so if you haven't answered that, feel free to do that. Um, as we get started, Bonnie, do we have some housekeeping things we wanna take care of? So what we'd like to ask is that if, uh, if you guys can um, mute your microphones while the presentation is going, uh, that would uh, just help uh, to eliminate any background noise. Um, you should see on your toolbar, usually at the bottom of your screen, a little microphone that says mute. If you click on that, that will, that will mute you. And then to unmute yourself, you just click that button again. Um, feel free to put questions in the chat as you think of them. We will have some time throughout the presentation where Dr. Johnson will be um, fielding questions. So feel free to put those questions in the chat whenever you think about them, and we will be sure to answer them. And then at the end of our session today, we'll have um, another opportunity for some Q&A, and uh, we'll be sharing some more resources with you at the end of the program. Um, I think that, that is that. So what I'd like to do is introduce our speaker for today's uh, presentation. We have Dr. Adrian Johnson. Dr. Johnson is an assistant scientist at the UW Center for Tobacco Research and Intervention. And so that would be UWCTRI for short. She is a licensed clinical psychologist with expertise in health psychology and the treatment of individuals with neurological disorders. Dr. Johnson received her bachelor's degree in psychology and philosophy from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She then worked for two years at UW-CTRI as a health counselor helping individuals quit smoking. Using skills she learned while working as a health counselor, Johnson went on to obtain her PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Cincinnati with a focus on health psychology. She completed her pre-doctoral uh, clinical internship at the Baylor College of Medicine in Houston and her postdoctoral fellowship in women's health at the William S. Middleton Memorial Veterans Hospital. Dr. Johnson's research focuses on reducing the negative impacts of smoking and better understanding the role of smoking on brain health, particularly Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. She was awarded a K-23 Career Development Award from the National Institute on Aging, as well as a developmental grant from the University of Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center to support her research. This funding will help Dr. Johnson develop two motivational interventions for smoking cessation in older adults consisting of 
a novel patient-informed motivational message promoting smoking cessation, and clear access routes to evidence-based smoking cessation treatment. So Dr. Johnson, we are so happy to have you with us today. Thank you for carving some time out of your schedule to be with us and, and, and uh, talk to us today about cigarette smoking and aging. And uh, so I'm gonna hand it over to you. And um, you okay, well, thank you for that very kind introduction and thanks everyone for joining today. Um, as you can see, we're going to be talking about cigarette smoking today, and thank you, thank you to those who participated in our little poll. Um, so I'm going to go over some learning objectives, and then we'll actually go to the answers from that poll as we go through this presentation. Uh, one of the things that I really want to focus on is understanding why cigarette sm smoking excuse me, is important in older adults, but then also talking about the health benefits of quitting at any age and talking about the relation between smoking and dementia, as well as mild cognitive impairment. All right, so back to that poll. Oh, before I do that, I should say, I wanna point out that I'll be discussing commercialized cigarette smoking in older adults, which is combustible cigarettes that you may buy at the store, gas station, so on. This does not include traditional or sacred tobacco, or other non-combustible forms of tobacco, like e-cigarettes, chew, dip, so on. And I'm happy to answer questions about those, but I wanna make that clear first and foremost. So to our poll, we asked you, well, what part of the body does smoking affect? Whoever said, and it was actually a lot of you guys, the whole body is correct. Good news is you're all correct because it also affects brain, lungs, uh, heart. It, unfortunately affects almost every organ in the body as this uh, diagram shows. And we know that smoking is actually the leading preventable cause of death and disability in the United States, resulting in almost half a million deaths per year. So to put that in perspective, that's more deaths than HIV, illegal drug use, alcohol use, automobile injuries, and gun-related incidents combined. The healthcare costs related to smoking are also tremendous, totaling over $300 billion a year. And this is because smoking harms nearly every organ of the human body. Some effects of smoking are discussed more often, like cancers, particularly lung cancer or esophageal cancer, and other things like stroke, high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes. But it can also lead to some less commonly discussed issues like hip fracture, which is a big concern for older adults, as well as pneumonia, blindness, COVID-19, and what we'll discuss more today, dementia. The health effects are even worse, unfortunately, for older smokers, who are three times more likely to die from a smoking-related disease than younger smokers. Research shows that older current smokers are 20% more likely to develop symptoms of depression compared to older adults who never smoked, and they're at increased risk of impaired mobility issues and increased risk for nursing home placement. So first I wanna point out, and this is always controversial, but I'm gonna explain why, that I'm looking at smokers ages 45 and up. Just may say that's not older, I get it. <laughs> this is partially due to the breakdown of age ranges from national databases, but it's also due to the smoking cessation guidelines that highlight smokers ages 50 and up as older smokers. So I didn't wanna to jump to 65 and up knowing that that would group of people who are still in that late middle age realistically to older adult age. When we look at smokers who are ages 45 to 64, there is the highest smoking rate for any age range, 16.3%. Smokers ages 65 and up are smoking at a lower rate of 8.4%. But notably, the population of older adults is expected to double in the next 25 years. So those older adults, that 18 million, unless they quit, can soon turn into 38 million smokers. And given the, that older adults are disproportionately burdened by the negative health effects of smoking, that means that they're more than double of all the health effects, medical costs, deaths, so on. So now more than ever, it's imperative that we help these smokers quit smoking. 
And currently, smokers over the age of 45 successfully quit at a rate of about 6%. So that means that out of the 100 smokers who quit, only six were able to quit for six months or more in the past year. When we look at the rate of successful quit attempts for our early adults and middle-aged smokers, this is less than half of the rate of successful quit attempts. Since the year 2000, older adults were consistent, consistently less likely to make a quit attempt, which is to try to quit for a day or longer in the past year, or to successfully quit, so quit for that six months or longer. And as a result, they had lower rates of smoking cessation compared to younger adult smokers. However, you can see that since 2000, the smoking rate has decreased from 23% to 13.7%. So that's about a 27, 28% reduction in the prevalence of smoking in the United States. But unlike the reduction of adults of all ages, adults ages 65 and older remain stagnant in cessation rates. They only changed by 2.1%. They showed a 2.1% reduction in smoking prevalence. So research suggests that lower cessation efforts or quit efforts in older adults could be due to a lot of different reasons. It might be due to beliefs about how effective treatment is or beliefs about the benefits of quitting. It could also be due to limited motivation to quit as well as unfortunately clinician inaction. Older smokers are less likely to receive advice to quit as well as evidence-based smoking treatment from healthcare professionals than younger smokers. In addition, doubts about the benefits of quitting at an older age and how effective those smoking cessation interventions may reduce their attempts to quit. So let's now talk about the benefits of quitting. So this is a nice graph I always like to use. Some of you may have seen it before. And one of the statistics you may have heard is that if you quit smoking, you could add 10 years to your life. And you may think, well, not me, I'm, I'm older. Okay, well, at 40 years, yes. If you quit smoking, you can add 10 years to your life. Well, what about 50 years? You can add six years to your life. At 60 years old, if you quit smoking, you can add three years to your life. And if we think about adding life years, it's also about the quality of that life. What will that life look like for me? Within one day of quitting, your risk of heart attack goes down. In two days, you notice an improved sense of smell and taste. Within two weeks, you can breathe better, exercise easier, your circulation improves. In a year, your risk of stroke and heart attack is cut in half. In five years, your risk of stroke is the same as a person who never smoked. And that's because your blood vessels begin to widen again, making blood clots less likely. In 10 years, your risk of dying from lung cancer is half that of a current smoker. Your risk of bladder cancer is half that of a current smoker. In 15 years, your risk of coronary artery disease is the same of that of a non-smoker. In 20 years, the risk of dying from all smoking-related causes is now the same as a non-smoker. So we know that smoking impacts diabetes, stroke, blood pressure, cancer risk, quality of life, mental health, death risk, but I'm also interested in examining the relation between smoking and dementia more specifically. So before we go to that, I wanna see if there are any questions from the audience and then we're gonna do a quick poll. So were there any questions, Jen? Yeah, we have um, <clears throat> a question. Uh, what is the relationship with smoking and bladder cancer? Ah, great question. Unfortunately, those who are smokers are at an increased risk for developing bladder cancer, but that is something that we know upon quitting, as I mentioned just now, your risk can go down. So one of the things we really like to highlight is that there is an ability to change. There is an ability to lower your risk. And the other thing that we know for all cancers is that your quality of life and cancer symptoms actually do improve upon quitting. It's not immediate. And there is that two week hump of getting through the quitting process, but it is something to know that even if you are diagnosed with cancer, quitting can benefit you. It can make your life still easier. And while dealing with something as hard as cancer is, it's particularly important. Any other questions? Um, not at the moment. Okay. So then we're gonna do a set our second poll and Bonnie, I don't know if you wanna get that up.
Okay, so our second poll is, when is it too late to quit smoking? After you tried to quit, but went back to smoking regularly? After you turned 50? After your doctor stops asking you to quit? When they stop questioning you, nope, don't do it anymore. Or it's never too late to quit. Just give a couple more seconds. We see we already have 10 answers there. All right, you guys are too smart. <laughs> okay, your answer of it's never too late. That is the right answer. And I kind of tried to give it away as best I can, but I want to highlight it again and again. It is never too late. And that's something that can be really hard to uh, grapple with as you're dealing with other health issues at an older age. Unfortunately, the older you get, the more likely you are to experience almost all health effects, both of smoking, but just of aging as well. So it's really important to remember that you can still find a benefit in quitting in terms of your health and your quality of life and how you live your life. So let's now shift to smoking and dementia. All right, so Dr. Chin accurately describes smoking as a modifiable risk factor for Alzheimer's disease and related dementia. So let's talk a little bit about that. An estimated 6.2 million people suffer from dementia in the United States, and the annual cost is just over $355 billion. So the incidence and related economic burden of dementia is expected to triple by 2050. That's huge. And due to that rapid growth and overwhelming impact, as well as unfortunately the refractoriness of this disease to current treatments, greater focus is needed on targeting modifiable risk factors to prevent and slow the development of dementia. Targeting these risk factors could prevent approximately 40% of dementia cases. And one modifiable risk factor that is indirectly linked, and I'll explain what that means, to dementia onset and cognitive decline, irrespective of genetic risk, is cigarette smoking. Smoking directly increases your likelihood, so that's our little line from cigarette smoking to all of these health effects, and, and this A arrow, to at least five known risk factors of dementia onset, including diabetes, hypertension, stroke heart disease, high cholesterol. Smoking cessation or quitting can lower these risk factors. So that's that line B from all these health effects to dementia, even among an aging population. Notably, smoking is considered a late life risk factor, meaning that smoking at ages 65 and older leads to an increased risk of dementia. And as I'll highlight in the next few slides, changing smoking, even at a later age, can lower your dementia risk. So we know that overall smoking is undoubtedly related to dementia through this link of health effects it has. I mentioned in my last slide that smoking is a risk factor. And when we look at the epidemiological data, so that's the data of all the populations over many years, I shouldn't say all, of various populations over many years, but looking at thousands and thousands of people, the direct um, and examining the direct link between um, smoking and dementia, we find that cigarette smoking is prospectively associated with up to a 70% increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. So not just any type of dementia, but Alzheimer's specifically. It accounts for at least 14% of individuals with Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia. In comparison, Non-modifiable risk factors or ones that you can't change, such as the APOE4 gene, account for only 7% of the current dementia cases. And interestingly, a recent cross-sectional study of almost 200 men in China found that current smokers versus never smokers had elevated levels of biomarkers in their cerebral spinal fluid that are associated with Alzheimer's disease. There was also significantly higher levels of oxidative stress, neuroinflammation, and impaired neuroprote neuroprotection. You can see as I stumble over these big words, what do they mean? What they mean is that smoking has a biological 
and measurable effect on the, the markers that we know are related to dementia. We also know that quitting smoking, even in an elderly population, has been shown in longitudinal cohort studies to reduce the risk of dementia and slow cognitive decline. So there is growing data highlighting the benefit of quitting, even at an older age. And I'm gonna break down this research a little bit because I know there's a lot of numbers and it's a little confusing. So the first was conducted over 11 years. This was from 2002 to 2013. It was, I mentioned thousands. This was in 50,000 Chinese adult males and they were all ages 60 and older. And they found that quitting compared to continual smoking for at least four years, reduce the risk of all-cause dementia and vascular dementia for the next eight years. The second study, which was conducted among both males and females, again, ages 65 and up, and it was in Japan, showed that compared to current smokers, those who had quit smoking for three or more years had mitigated or stopped the risk of dementia incurred by smoking. That is to say that the risk of incident dementia among ex-smokers became the same level, the statistically not, statistically not significant difference, it's my special words, as that of a never smoker if they maintained abstinence for three years. And then the third study and most recent study conducted among 13,000 American men and women ages 52 to 75 found that although quitting at any time suggested a benefit, Quitting nine years more, ben, sorry, sorry, quitting for nine years or more before the baseline assessment was not associated with dementia. So overall, epidemiological studies have found that quitting smoking for as little as three years can make you comparable, comparable to a never smoker. I want to point out, though, all of these studies are observational in nature. So what that means is we were watching, we were watching as people age, we were watching as they made choices to quit and so on. We didn't say you have to quit now and you keep smoking. It wasn't experimental per se. Only one experimental study to date has prospectively, so over the future, evaluated the cognitive effects of successfully quitting in humans. And this study was conducted among 230 current smokers. They were all ages 68 years and older. And they were invited to participate in a smoking cessation trial, so a quit smoking trial. And what they found was that within 24 months, two years, the pace or the rate of cognitive decline was significantly lower for those who successfully quit versus those who continued to smoke. So what that means is those who quit showed less cognitive decline over a period than those who kept smoking. Unfortunately, the smoking dementia relationship is continually questioned, and that's due to a lot of reasons. And I'm gonna go over some of those now and give kind of my responses to them. So it could be due to early studies, which are studies in big name journals that smoking protected against dementia onset. However, a large 2010 meta-analysis by Cataldo and colleagues demonstrated that the tobacco industry those who make cigarettes, sell cigarettes, profit from cigarettes, moderated the effects. So association or affiliation with the tobacco industry moderated or changed the effects of smoking on dementia. So basically studies affiliated with the tobacco favorable results, or they, they said that basically smoking protects against dementia, or they said smoking doesn't affect dementia. While those who were not affiliated with the tobacco industry demonstrated consistent negative results. So they said, actually smoking has a negative impact on dementia, meaning you're more likely to get dementia if you do smoke. There's also confusion about the role of nicotine versus cigarette smoking. And this is particularly important when we're discussing mild cognitive impairment. Nicotine, which is the main addictive ingredient in cigarettes is a stimulant. And it's been shown to provide beneficial effects for patients with mild cognitive impairment in terms of attention, memory, psychomotor speed. And this was shown with transdermal nicotine patches. This, which I will show you later, this is not a cigarette. 
this is a way to get nicotine, again, the main addictive ingredient. Considerable research, tens of thousands, honestly, of studies have shown that cigarette smoke, which includes over 5,000 toxic chemicals, has demonstrated both immediate and long-term negative effects on both cognition, how we think, as well as dementia onset. Then if we look at competing risks, which are events of similar clinical importance that prevent or change the likelihood of a main outcome of interest, complicate studies in older adult populations. And that's because increasing age, which is the strongest risk factor for dementia, is as we said, associated with a host of other unfortunate medical issues. And those other medical issues may underestimate the relationship between smoking and dementia. So let me just break that down. If a smoker is at increased risk for so many negative health outcomes, including death, they may therefore die before a study is completed. And when we look at that data, that may result in underestimating the effect of smoking on health as well as dementia. The other thing that's important to point out is that certain proxy variables for dementia are rarely considered. One could be nursing home placement. More than two thirds of nursing home residents have dementia, making it one of the primary reasons for nursing home placement. So it could be that nursing home placement is a proxy for undiagnosed dementia. We know that in this country, about half of existing cases of dementia are undiagnosed. So unfortunately, although the literature is limited, findings generally support that smoking is linked to an increased risk for nursing home placement. Looking at these proxy variables may help address the issue of underdiagnosis in dementia. So that's going to lead to uh, some of the research that uh, I've conducted with colleagues here. And I'd like to go into that. But before I do, I want to check in and see, are there any additional questions? Because I know I'm, I'm given a lot of information. Yeah. So um, Dr. Jensen, we've got a couple questions. Um, <clears throat> Is there a relationship between smoking and depression? There is. That is a really good question. Unfortunately, what we know is that smoking, so the act of smoking, not only increases your risk of developing depression later on, but a lot of people actually try to smoke in order to deal with their emotions. And unfortunately, the opposite effect occurs, that they're more likely to develop depression, both symptoms and diagnoses. And then there's a lot of thought about, well, what about when people quit smoking? Could they then develop depression because they don't know how to deal with their, their emotions? We've actually found through a lot of really good research that the risk of developing depression is not higher among those who've quit. And we know that the risk of depression uh, compared to those who don't smoke. The, we know that the risk of depression is higher among those who continue to smoke. So the opposite is true. Great, great question. Any other questions? Yeah, um, the uh, one, one of our guests has asked, you may address this later, but I'm curious about vaping and the relationship as so many people have transitioned from smoking to vaping. Yes. So um, I'm, I can speak to that a little bit and I won't address it later. So I'm glad you asked. I have a slide that I could show the percentages um, of vaping in, in the 65 and older population. It has not gone up as much as it actually had in the past in the adolescent teenage group. As, so it's not a comparable rise. In the teenage group, it skyrocketed and it's actually gone down a fair amount for a couple of reasons. A lot of public health efforts um, some concerns about the health effects that occurred across the country from vaping um, due to using incorrect pods as well. In the older adult, I'm using my hand graphs, <laughs> in the older adult population, it's been a very slow increase. So there's not been so much more uptake in the use of vaping in the older adult population. But I will say compared to 20 years ago, yeah, it's way higher. And then if you think about the use of different products, the vaping industry is a multi-billion dollar industry and they have effectively cornered how to make these products the most addictive thing possible. So they, they changed to salt-based 
uh, vape products. And I won't go into the biochemistry of that, but what I will say is that they they're get to your brain much quicker. There's concerns about how they are uh, managed by the Federal Drug uh, Administration because they're so much more addictive and there's not as much control over how much nicotine is in it. So the difference between cigarettes, combustible, the ones that you smoke more traditionally, and vape pens or jewel or what might you have you um, is a couple of things. One is how it's getting into your body, how quickly it's hitting and jewel can hit really fast, unfortunately. And the other is um, the difference in carcinogens. We know that there are less carcinogens in vape pens uh, versus combustible cigarettes. Cause if you think about starting a fire, right? That's going to cause more carcinogens, which is what a combustible thing is versus a vape pen. But there's not as much research on the health effects of vaping. And that's where a lot of the research is ongoing at this center, actually. What we do know in terms of going on a bit of a tangent, but I'm glad you asked what we do know in terms of um, use of uh, e-cigarettes or vaping products is that sometimes people use them as a way to quit smoking. And the concern there is most often, unfortunately, a lot of times when people start to use vape pens with their cigarettes, they, the hope is that you get rid of the cigarette and then go to the vape pen because there are less carcinogens. And, and I, I understand that part. What we found is that unfortunately it leads more commonly to, to co-use. So then you're using both. So we would want it to be fully stopped. Ideally you would stop everything, but that's a different discussion. So again, bit of a tangent because I love that topic, um, but there's not information at this point on e-cigarettes and dementia or cognitive decline. That is an area of research that I plan to uh, move into. Sorry, Jen, any other questions? Oh, no, that was a great <laughs> explanation. Thank you for taking the time to share that. Um, I just wanna make sure I heard you correctly uh, yes. when you were talking about modifiable risk factors. Did uh, did you say that when addressed, they can reduce the risk of developing dementia by up to 40%? Did I hear that right? They can actually prevent up to 40% of dementia, okay. not even reduce the risk by 40%. No, they okay. can prevent up to 40% of dementia cases. So when we talk about all the modifiable risk factors, and there's many, um, and Dr. Chin can speak to others because this is a lot of work that is being done at the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. Physical exercise is a big component, sleep, diet, alcohol use, smoking, of course, um, and others. So those are basically factors that you can change. That's why they're called modifiable risk factors. And they're particularly important because unfortunately we don't have a medication yet that is able to treat or stop dementia. So we're, we're really focusing on what can we do to slow it down and hopefully prevent it. Thank All you right, for so, clarifying that. Yeah, it was, yes. uh, it just kind of like hit me with a ton of bricks. <laughs> we were talking about it, like that's really significant. It's a big and, number. Yes. Um, so uh, thank you for, for sharing all of those statistics. Yeah. Um, I'm going to jump into some research that I did and I'm going to try to not bog you down too much with my sciencey side. Um, because I, as you probably have seen, tend to geek out a little bit, but I want to share some work that we did recently. And this was in the United States. So we use data from the National Alzheimer's Coordinating Center, which is called the NAC. Um, and this data set from, is from Alzheimer's disease centers across the country. And they collected longitudinal, so over time data on individuals as a way to examine dementia risk. So we looked back to at over 10,000 cognitively healthy adults over a period of 14 years. So this was 2005 to 2019 from, um, to comprehensively examine the impact of smoking on dementia as well as death. So participants were 45 years or older. They had no dementia or mild cognitive impairment diagnosis at the start of this. And they were not predisposed to or diagnosed with strongly heritable forms of dementia or uh, a hereditary mutation, so at baseline. So what we did was we examined the impact of three smoking-related variables on incident or oncoming dementia and death. The first was smoking status, so that was broken into current smoker, former smoker, so you used to smoke but you quit, and uh, never smoker. The way that this is done in that data set is 
if you smoked over 100 cigarettes in your lifetime and you're smoking in the past 30 days, you would be in the, in the current smoker group. If you smoked over 100 cigarettes, but you didn't smoke in the past 30 days, you're in the former smokers. And never smokers said, we've never smoked more than 100 in our lifetime. We also looked at smoking exposure. So that is the lifetime smoking exposure is defined in pack years. So that's the multiplication of packs per day times your smoke. So there's 20 cigarettes in a pack just for everyone to be on the same page. And someone who smokes one pack of cigarettes per day for 20 years would have a pack year of 20 pack years. Last, we looked at duration of abstinence. How long did you quit? And we split that by decades of being quit. Dementia was defined as a dementia diagnosis in follow-up or, and this is getting at some of those proxy variables, a nursing home placement coupled with a cognitive uh, dysfunction evaluation score of one or higher. So this is a common scale. The CDR is a common scale used to determine cognitive dysfunction. So we basically said, we want to capture people who maybe didn't have a dementia diagnosis, but they're in the nursing home and they're actually showing that they would qualify for it if they did a more thorough evaluation. We predicted that current smokers would be at a greater risk for dementia and death than never smokers. We also predicted that former smokers would be comparable to never smokers. So we expected that a greater lifetime exposure would relate to an increased risk of dementia, death from baseline, and death following dementia. And lastly, we expected that the longer former smokers were abstinent or had quit, the more comparable they would be in terms of dementia risk to never smokers. So we put in some covariates, which are other variables that we think are relevant to make sure we were being comprehensive. And these included gender, education, recent hypertension or diabetes. And we use what's called a multi-state Cox proportional hazard model. It's a lot of words, I'm gonna break it down. Basically multi-state models allow for the most comprehensive look at the smoking dementia relationship and they account for death. So there are many ways to account for death. And I highlighted why that's important, right? Because smoking leads to an increased risk of death. Um, most existing research, what's called sensors death. And what that means is when someone dies, they're removed from the sample and they're not include, included in analysis that point on. And that can lead to that, lead to that competing risk issue we talked about before. So that's this A, this, uh, or sorry, that's not A yet. So the next option would be to account for it in analyses by using a combined outcome. So that is A. So that's when we basically say, well, leads to dementia or death, but that doesn't allow us to really break apart. Is it dementia or death? which we know is a risk of smoking. So then there's competing risk models, one of which is called the fine, fine and gray analyses. And that's a really great next step, but it leaves out one important piece. What happens if a person gets dementia and then that pathway after that, because you don't just stop after dementia and then they die afterwards. So by looking at a multi-state model, we can look at pathways related to death and dementia and really break down this relationship. Okay, I talked about all the math. I geeked out a little bit. So let's get into what we found. What we found is that current smokers were 1.7 times more likely to get dementia and three times more likely to die than never smokers. They were also almost twice as likely to die after getting dementia. So take a moment here. They were more likely to get dementia. They were more likely to die, but also even after getting dementia. There's a, so this speaks to the importance of quitting even after a dementia diagnosis. To ensure the findings related to that transition from dementia to death weren't solely due to the impact of smoking on known cardiovascular risk factors, like a stroke, for example, we looked at the duration of time in each transition state. Um, and what we found is that the conversion of dementia to death wasn't solely due to stroke for current or former smokers. And that was also irrespective of how many pack years they smoked. So findings paint a picture that current smoking not only results in death, but can also lead to suffering through lost cognitive functioning and independence. When we look at former smokers, we were surprised because we found that former smokers were less likely to get dementia than never smokers. Great news, right? But a little surprising. 
when we looked at the data, we found that most of our former smokers in this sample, um, so just almost 60%, had quit over three decades ago, 30 years ago. And that may have highlighted some cohort effect of that group and a broader shift towards healthy lifestyle changes for those other modifiable risk factors, maybe. Maybe they changed their diet, their exercise, their alcohol intake, and that could have contributed to a decreased risk of dementia. But importantly, the change in smoking behavior did not result in, it, in a decreased risk of death from baseline or following dementia compared to never smokers. So it is still problematic in terms of those issues. Contrary to our hypothesis, so not what we expected, the re end research demonstrating what's called a dose response relationship. So the more you smoke, the more effect it'll have between smoking and dementia. There was no association between lifetime smoking exposure, so those pack years, and instant dementia onset. However, there was an association between greater pack years and an increased risk for death from baseline, suggesting that lifetime smoking exposure is more related to death than other dementia related outcomes. So the more you smoke over years has an impact in terms of death, but it doesn't have an impact in terms of your dementia risk or risk of death following dementia. And it reinforces that critical impact of current smoking. It's the behavior rather than the overall cumulative lifetime impact of smoking on dementia onset. We also explored whether there were any recency effects, basically looking at what about people who've quit? And our hypothesis was that compared to those who never smoked, the longer those who had, the longer former smokers had been quit, the, um, there would be an association with lower risk of dementia. And that was only partially supported. So what we found was that recent smokers, recent quitters, excuse me, those who had quit within 10 years and those who had quit between 10 and 20 years ago had no significant difference in risk of dementia compared to never smokers. Okay, so that's, that's good, right? They're not different than never smokers. We don't wanna overreach from the data and we know that there's a small sample of recent quitters, but the data here suggests that within 10 years of quitting, former smokers are not statistically different from never smokers in terms of dementia risk. Interestingly, again, smokers who quit for 30 years were actually less likely to develop dementia than never smokers. So it was kind of opposite where we said, oh, wow, it's not just you're the same, but you're less likely than a never smoker. And again, that could really highlight a change in, in overall health behaviors of those group of smokers who quit 30 years ago. They may have changed other things in their life. Um, but overall, it's really showing us that in terms of uh, effects of quitting, that once you quit for as little as 10 years from this study, because that was the lowest grouping that we had, um, you're comparable to a never smoker in terms of risk for dementia. In terms of death, however, it took 10 years of quitting to be statistically comparable. Overall, we found this to mean that smoking has stronger relations with death than with dementia onset. And consequently, the risk for dementia may be changed quicker after quitting. So taken together, I know I used a lot of jargon and different words. The highlights here are that baseline cognitively healthy people who are current smoking are not only three times more likely than never smokers to transition to death, but they're also almost twice as likely to go from baseline cognitive health to dementia, as well as subsequent dementia to death. Quitting smoking even for less than 10 years made older smokers not statistically different from never smokers in terms of risk for dementia, suggesting that risk is better attributed to recency or the current smoking behavior. These findings show that current smoking increases the risk of death and can lead to suffering through loss of cognitive functioning and independence and suggest a benefit of smoking cessation at any age for cognitively healthy individuals. So this is consistent with epidemiological data highlighting the negative impact of cigarette smoking on incident dementia onset. The World Health Organization, the National Academy of Medicine, and the Alzheimer's Association state that smoking cessation is a top priority for reducing cognitive decline and preventing dementia onset. So I want to shift here to how we can help, but let's break and see if there are any questions about this research, because I know there was a lot of models and funny things there. Okay, we don't have any new questions. 
Um, Great. I usually bore them with this part. So let's move on. To that. <laughs> okay. So then let's talk about how can we help our older patients and our older partners and ourselves potentially quit smoking. Okay. So first thing is the five A's. The five A's is something that uh, probably the providers on this call are familiar with. And this is a uh, best practice. It starts with ask. So ask about smoking at every visit. It also means ask about smoking regularly if you're a caregiver for someone. Um, you probably know if you're living with that person, but just in case, um, using an open stance to invite discussion of this behavior is particularly important. What's keeping you from quitting? What would quitting mean to you? Also to advise to quit. It's the best thing you can do for your health. It can add 10 years to your life. If you're 40 years old, we talked about at different ages, it could add more at 60 years, it could add three years, but adding in those personal benefits, if they say they want to live longer for their kids, note how they can be around longer, but also kind of be more present with their cognitive health. And the other thing is to correct misconceptions about the benefits. Thoughts like, I've done this before, I've done this for so long, I can't make a change now, can be reframed or shifted to, you feel like it would be hard to make this change since you've been doing this for years and then add information about quitting. Did you know that older adults are actually more successful than younger adults when they use medication to quit? Or I've tried to quit so many times, it doesn't work, right? I hear this a lot in my practice. Can be changed to, you're an expert at quitting. You know what quitting is like for you. So let's get you the support so this could be the last time you have to do it. Did you know that using smoking cessation medicines can double or even triple your success at quitting? The third A is to assess, are they willing to quit? And some people are not, that is okay. If that is the case, there are different ways you can approach that. One form of treatment is called motivational interviewing. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in just a moment. The fourth A is to assist if they are interested in quitting. And this is particularly important because we know it happens less often, unfortunately, in older adults and in sick older adults. Provide them with evidence-based treatment. Refer them to get the nicotine replacement therapy, to get counseling. Use the quit line. There's facts and text options, and I will talk about that more in a minute. But know that that is a wonderful resource available across the country to call 1-800-QUIT-NOW. You are basically the gatekeeper to these treatments for a lot of these individuals. Also, when they see that, when you see them again, remind, ask them, how is it going? But also know that they're already primed if you're a provider to be thinking about their health. And that's a really pivotal moment to say, oh, you're already thinking about your health. This could be the time to make that change when we think about the psychology behind behavioral changes. All right, and the last A is arrange, schedule a follow-up to ask about quitting and do ask about it. When I've talked to people before, they've said, well, I tried and then they never asked again. So I said, I guess it wasn't really that important. Show them it is important. Show them you do care. I know there's a million, more than a million things to do at each visit, but if they're making that change that can affect every uh, part of their body, we really do wanna check in because that's particularly important. We know that half of older, adult smokers are interested in quitting. I should know before I go further, there's a briefer version of this called ask, advise, refer. And I imagine that's gonna be used more commonly because people don't have time, particularly those who are working in clinics or providers in general. So that's intended to be used as brief interventions. And there's actually free training for this for healthcare providers. It's from the American Lung Association. I have the, uh, the website for this available, but it's really great brief free training on how to do this. The first two are the same as we discussed and refer is to refer the patient for treatment. So given that we're already talking about older adults with cognitive issues, it may be best to stick with the five A's since having them plan to call someone independently could be a bit daunting. However, again, there's free training. It only lasts an hour and it could be a great um, advice on how to ask about smoking and how to advise to quit. Motivation waxes and wanes like waves. So one of the ways we can help is by acting as a reminder for cessation. Research shows that structured follow-up counseling increases cessation success for older adults. Research also shows us that older adults are interested in quitting. 
54% of those 65 and older are interested in quitting and 68% of 45 to 64 year olds who smoke are interested. So how can we help them quit? Beyond the five A's or, use, or even the AAR model, we can make sure they get the best treatment options. All right, so these are the best evidence-based methods to help older adults quit. Funny story, they're the same thing you would use for younger adults, but I wanna point that out, this is what works. First is nicotine replacement therapy. And I'm actually going to go into a couple of those today. Um, but then there's also propion, varenicline, and counseling. In terms of concerns people may have about uh, varenicline and propion, there previously was concern and a black label, actually, a black box label about the um, effects of varenicline and propion on mental health in terms of suicidality. Some of you may have heard about this. I want to be very clear. There was a very, very large international study. It's called the Eagle study that showed there is no greater risk of mental health issues, suicidality from using bupropion versus nicotine replacement therapy. So what I'm saying is there's no black box label that is no longer a concern. I say that because that information doesn't always get spread. But if you would like to individually, I encourage you to look that up. It's called the Eagle study. Um, but there's no longer a black label on that. It is not a concern about mental health issues. Okay, so that's my PSA for that. Regarding nicotine replacement therapy, one thing to note for older adults in particular is that the gum, the nicotine gum, which you use differently than normal gum, it can be di difficult to use with dentures. So other forms of nicotine replacement therapy, like the mini lozenge and the nicotine patch might be a great start. What we know is that recent meta-analyses suggest that combination is the best option, particularly medication with behavioral interventions. And we also know that older adults tend to respond particularly well to interventions from physicians. So highlighting the benefit of quitting at any age in terms of diabetes, blood pressure, brain health, stroke, dementia, but also ensure referral and access to evidence-based treatment. Older smokers report lower likelihood of getting medications to help quit. And remember that when older adults use evidence-based treatments, they're actually more likely to be successful at quitting than younger adults. They can quit. They just need our help to do so. All right, so before I go into my quick demonstration, I wanna see if there are any questions um, now that I've gone over kind of some of the how-tos. Yeah, uh, thank you for all of that, Dr. Johnson. We do have a question. <clears throat> How do you feel about uh, quitting cold turkey versus a gradual taper? That is a great question. And I love that you use the phrase cold turkey because that's what we call it. And then there's been some funny advertisements about turkeys. So <laughs> um, quitting cold turkey, or what that means is quitting without the using of, of any treatment, um, particularly any evidence-based treatment, is actually the most common way people try to quit. I really... Part of what I strive to do is to let people know about these treatments and the benefit of them, because what we know, unfortunately, is that the, that's why the, quit, the successful quit rate is so low. Only 7% of people who try to quit smoking are successful. And that's because less than 30% of people who try to quit use treatment. So basically, quitting cold turkey is difficult in terms of maintaining your abstinence. When you talk about a gradual uh, tapering, there, um, there's varying research and there's more coming out about that um, rather than completely stopping versus cutting down. And let's say we're staying within that, I'm not using any other treatment, right, for this. Um, the notion behind that is, well, I can start to like train, how do I deal with it in different situations? But some of our recent research has actually found that it's not helpful to taper down um, and had some reverse effects, which is contrary to previous research. So I will say there's mixed results on that. Overall, more broadly, what I will say is that if we're talking about, should I stop all at once versus cut down? Either way you do it, you should make a quit day. And we'll talk about this more. And you should be using some sort of treatment, please, because it will help. Okay, any other questions, Jen? No, it's this, like yeah. this is Bonnie. I just wanted to uh, add um, my personal experience as a 
um, former smoker. I tried tons of things that you're going to talk about. I called the helpline. I, 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 I um, got the gum sent to me. I, I used the patch and I, I had some success. And then I, I did start to smoke again. And so the last time I quit, I, I haven't smoked for over six and a half years now, but I did set a quit date, but that's all I did. I'm like, I'm just going to smoke how I want because tapering off to me just didn't seem, you know, for me, I'm like, I'm going to do it big or I'm not going to do it at all. So like mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. picked a date two weeks out and that's, that's what I did after trying numerous different ways and, and calling the mm -hmm. line, um was so beneficial. They were super great and giving me the tools I needed for when I finally actually been able to have some abstinence from smoking. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. And, and the piece, and Bonnie and I have talked about this before, so I don't think she would mind. Um, she, she mentioned having tried multiple times. That's not uncommon. Try, try again. That is unfortunately a difficulty. It's a very addictive substance. But the things that the quit line can provide are tools. How do I deal with these cravings? How do I deal with waking up and usually having a cigarette? What do I do differently? What if it's really a good friend to me? How do I deal with that? How do I live my life without this? For those of you who maybe don't smoke or have never smoked, some of these things can seem a little off. When you talk to people who have smoked, those are all kind of, yeah, yeah, that probably fits. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit on how to use the, the patch because unfortunately, a lot of these things get used incorrectly a lot. And that's, that's true for a lot of medications, but this one is an over-the-counter um, treatment. So I'll go into how you can get it uh, in a little bit, but I want to just give a quick example and I'm going to leave my screen up, um, but you can look in the camera and see me use the patch. So this is our little patch. It's clear. So you can't see it. And it, this was, uh, we actually have Nicoderm here because we're running a clinical trial and that's the drug we're using for that. Um, I'm not going to put it on now because I am not currently smoking and I don't want to give myself too much nicotine, which will make me really amped up, but possibly nauseous, <laughs> but I will show you. So you see how there's um, two little peel back parts. So you peel it back and it's kind of a gel on the one side. First thing, so the nicotine patch comes in three different doses and you can see it says step one on what I put up there. So it says on the box, which dose you or your partner maybe would use based on your current smoking consumption. And you, you look at it and say, oh, I'm smoking this amount. This is what I should do. So you step down, you start with the highest dose first and then slowly step down. And that's how it's weaning you off of the nicotine. Because remember, this is providing you with the addictive ingredient in cigarettes in order to help your cravings be less. And it naturally weans you off. So in terms of the nicotine patch, you cut it out. Don't cut across the middle because you will cut the patch. And we don't want to do that. It doesn't work very well when you do that. Cut on the end, open it up. And then it's got these covers and it's sticky on the back. So you peel the back cover and you press it, I'm wearing a long sleeve, so it's kind of hard to do this, but say my sleeves all the way up, you press it on a clean, dry, hairless upper part of your body. I say hairless because I've worked with many gentlemen who would want to put it on their upper back. And I've said, that's fine. Just shave a little area if you need to. It should be hairless though. It could be your upper arm, your side, um, your stomach. That's fine. So you hold it and you press it firmly. So you can see it's under my hand for 10 seconds. And you wake, make, want, the, want to make sure that the patch is flat and smooth against your skin, okay? So that it's getting into your skin. That's how it's gonna work. So then you leave it on there. I'm obviously taking my example off and you would wash your hands, which I will do after this demonstration. The reason you're washing your hands is you might have some nicotine on your hands. You don't wanna be eating food and swallowing it. That'll cause you some stomach aches, okay? So you use your highest dose patch first, and then you switch to the next highest dose until you've used all your patches. This is important. Use it on a different, so you use one patch a day. And I say this and it may seem obvious, but it may not seem obvious. That's why I say it. We've had a lot of people who've used a patch and then they put another patch on a different place. No, you take the old one off, you put the new one on, okay? Don't put the patch on burned, cut, swollen, red, or sore skin. So if you've got a bump here, put it somewhere else. So say I start here one day. Okay, well, the next morning I take off this one and I put the new one. We'll imagine this is new over here. And I want you to go through at least three spots. So you're just giving your skin a break in that one spot. Okay, that's one thing. So you're only wearing one patch a day. You're putting it on a different area each day. 
what if you get nightmares from the patch? Unfortunately, some people can say, oh, I've just got some really, usually it's more vivid dreams than nightmares. Some people like them because they're just very lively. It doesn't happen to everybody. But if that's the case for you, then you can take the patch off before you go to bed. What will happen then, you'll probably have a bit stronger cravings in the morning because you're not getting that nicotine as a slow dose throughout the night, right? But if that's the case, don't just stop and give up. Try to take it off at night, see if that works. Um, so that's how you use the patch. One thing that I mentioned is combination therapy works best. Um, we also know that in terms of like combination counseling and medication works, but sometimes it's really good. A lot of times it's really good to have a combination of nicotine replacement therapy. So that means you would have this slow dose of nicotine from the patch throughout the day, but also you may use something like a mini lozenge. And that's what we call ad lib. So you use it when you get higher cravings. You also may use it preventatively when you know you would really want to smoke. So if I always have a, a cigarette right after lunch, that would be the time where I would say, I'm going to have my mini lozenge now because it's going to give me a little extra burst of nicotine during that period to help you ride that urge. Urges, a lot of people feel they're going to go and go and go and go and go. What we actually know is that urges go up and they come down. They usually last three to five minutes and you can make it through those three to five minutes, but you need to remember that's how long it lasts. If you're thinking it's going to last forever, yeah, it's going to be a hard game, but it won't. So I'm going to just briefly talk about the mini lozenges. I don't have one here and I'm not actually going to put one in my mouth again because I don't want to feel not so great um, because I'm not smoking <laughs> and I haven't for a very long time. So for a mini lozenge, you want to use one mini lozenge every one to two hours. You want to try to use nine a day. And how do you use them? You take the mini lozenge and you let it dissolve. Do not chew it. Okay. The reason is the mini lozenge is actually the, it's trying to dissolve and go through your gums because that's the way, the subcutaneous way it goes in. If you chew it, you're essentially going to not get it into your body the right way. And you're going to swallow it and it's going to go in your stomach and you're going to have a stomach ache. So you're trying to let it dissolve through your cheeks and your gums. You may notice a tingle when the medication starts to work. You want to move the mini lozenge around your mouth until it's completely dissolved, right? Get it all along those guns, gums, excuse me, let it seep in. That's good. So the nicotine lozenges help you combat, as do the patch, withdrawal symptoms to help you cope with stop smoking. However, since the nicotine from the lozenge goes into your bloodstream more slowly than nicotine from a cigarette, it doesn't give you the same quick hit right? Cigarettes, nicotine from cigarettes hits your brain as fast as cocaine does. It's almost instantaneous. It's amazing. In fact, when using as directions, lozenges gradually wean you off your dependence. So they're doing what you want to do. It's just important to know it's not going to be a immediate, but it will help you make it through that. And when you have the patch, in addition to the lozenge, you have that slow dose to help you hopefully have less cravings. But if you do have a craving that will lower it. Okay. And to be honest, people usually have some cravings and that's okay. We talked about not chewing or swallowing the mini lozenge. Try not to smoke uh, and use a mini lozenge at the same time. I mean, obviously you wouldn't have a cigarette and a mini lozenge at the same time, but if you're using one, you um, don't wanna smoke. That said, keep using your medicine if you slip, if you have a cigarette after your quit day, right? Cause it will help you get back on track. Don't use more than one mini lozenge at a time or more than five in six hours or 20 a day. And these are all on the packages. I'm just kind of going through a little bit. Um, use the mini lozenges the whole time, but start cutting down during the last two weeks and using the mini lozenges help you uh, quit. So I mentioned here at the bottom, while these are OTC or over-the-counter treatments, please contact your doctor if you experience strong adverse effects. So common side effects, heartburn, nausea, hiccup, coughing, headache and flatulence or gas. So a lot of times heartburn, nausea, hiccup and coughing is from people chewing or swallowing the nicotine. So I just wanna highlight that. But in terms of, these are all package inserts, but just to be very clear, stop using the mini lozenge and contact your doctor. If you've got mouth problems like pain or sore, persistent indigestion or severe sore throat, and it could be because you're using it not the best way, irregular heartbeat or palpitations, or nicotine overdose symptoms, nausea, vomiting, dizziness, weakness, and rapid heartbeat. 
could be that you just need less. In terms of the patch, we said, again, change it every day, always remove the, mold, the old one. If you have sleep problems when you have the patch on, take it off at bedtime and put a new one on in the morning. Use your patches the whole time. And for the patches, keep them away from children's and pets, please. We did not all see Bonnie's cat, but I think of the animals. So please do that. Keep them in a dry store, a uh, dry, cool place. Cold would be your car overnight. Not a great place for them right now, but also in the summer, not a great place. Cause you think about a candy bar. We just don't want to leave it in a really hot place. Okay. So that's my little demonstration before I go into other how to's any questions on those pieces. have any questions that have popped up yet but that was an excellent demonstration oh thank you Dr. Johnson thank you so much I learned a lot from that good I'm a little rusty on doing those so I'm glad mm. it was excellent <laughs> I wouldn't good. have known good job <laughs> all right so let's keep going on more how to's I really try to make these presentations both informational but functional how, how do you really help with this so when we talk about treating de tobacco dependence and dementia or in mild cognitive impairment I want to be clear, there is no specific guideline that exists in terms of the published clinical best practice guidelines, okay? That said, we mentioned at the beginning what my expertise is and what my background is. So I'm going to give you some how-tos and some suggestions. So in terms of what you would do, do what we've already discussed, right? That's how you would help someone quit, and that's how if you're quitting yourself, you would quit. But there are some important points worth remembering that may guide recommendations. First, Nicotine withdrawal is real, right? I said nicotine is the main addictive ingredient in cigarettes and it's significant for those who are quitting, okay? So it's actually one of the main reasons that people don't quit or they refrain from quitting. They don't wanna feel the effects of withdrawal. Withdrawal occur, occurs like a bell curve. I mentioned this, right? It goes up, then it goes down. A lot of people think it goes up and doesn't stop. That's not true, it does go down. We also know that it peaks during the first three to five days after quitting and quitting for approximately another, um, sorry, and continues for just about a week and a half and sometimes longer. But those first three to five days are the hardest. That's why most relapses occur in the first two weeks. And a relapse is when someone goes back to smoking. That's our formal word for it. Common withdrawal symptoms. The, the first one I highlight because of course, it's what we're talking about, right? Cognition. Cognition will likely be worse, especially working memory, which we know is impaired for multiple forms of dementia and in people who have mild cognitive impairment. Interestingly, we know that smoking cessation medications can help lessen the short-term negative cognitive effects of withdrawal. So those medications can help that piece. But just to be aware of that. In terms of irritability, I put that second because it's also regular, but it can feel as a person helping someone else quit as the most noticeable. Um, so be prepared, paired for irritability and try as best as you can to not take it personally. I remind this to my patients who are quitting all of the time, tell those around you that you're quitting and you're going to be off, right? What would be the best way for them to handle it? So it could be that the way someone helps you is maybe not the way they would think they would help you. I commonly use the example of the nagging aunt, right? Oh, my aunt really wants to quit, wants me to quit. She's so ready to help but man, does she bother me? Because she asked me every single day, how is it going? And I don't want to talk about it. Tell her, tell her beforehand. Maybe don't say don't nag me, but you can start by prefacing, hey, I'm really excited. I'm going to quit. Here's my quit day. What I really need from you is support in that if I call you, I want to talk about it. But if I don't, just know I'm trying my best and I don't really want to talk about it. Give them a heads up and and you'd actually be surprised when questions on how to help, how likely they are to do it. They just think they're helping and maybe aren't helping you in the best way. Okay. So other uh, withdrawal symptoms, cravings, which we talked about, fatigue, feeling a little tired and headaches. Okay. And then when we talk about other specifics, so we're talking about people you're working with in terms of maybe patients or we're talking about a partner, if you're a caregiver or a friend or whomever, be aware of what to expect and plan for it, okay? Bonnie highlighted wonderfully the quit date. The quit date is a date that they don't smoke anymore. They could be you, whoever's stopping quitting. 
not even a puff, okay? So before the quit day, remove all smoking related things from the house, lighter, ashtrays, cigarettes, so on and so forth. If it is your great grandmother Mary's special ashtray and you can't lose it because it's the most important thing now, clean it, put it away because it, it is a trigger. It's a reminder. The other thing is have the medicine, whatever pharmacotherapy you are going to use, which I encourage you to use um, if you can, available and ready. Figure out when they, if it's someone else quitting or you, if you are quitting, are more likely to smoke. What are the times that I would usually smoke? Because you know what? That's when I'm probably going to have a craving. It could be from triggers. So common triggers are stress, physical reminders, like seeing an ashtray, other smoking. It could also be boredom. Drinking alcohol is a big trigger. We actually encourage people to refrain from drinking alcohol for the first couple of weeks after quitting. If they can't do that, they can't stop completely to at least cut it down to minimum. But the reason behind that isn't because we want to just take everything away. It's because when you drink alcohol, your inhibitions are lowered and you're trying to make a change. And if you naturally reach for a cigarette, it's going to be a lot easier to do that versus stopping yourself. You're now training something different. Plan for that time. They'll likely have stronger urges during times when they have triggers. So have a plan for how to deal with those withdrawal symptoms and some coping strategies. We like to use what's called the four D's. The four D's are distract, distract yourself with something else for that three to five minute period. What am I going to do for three to five minutes? Could be, I'm going to watch the clock. Fine. It could be, I'm going to go on Facebook. Great. Could be, I'm going to look at pictures. It could be, I'm going to go vacuum, whatever it is, distract yourself. The second one, drink water. You cannot physically drink water and smoke cigarette at the same time. If you're swallowing both, it's not possible, but also it keeps your mouth busy and it cleans it. And sometimes that helps too. Delay. This is more the watching the clock. I just got to get through these five minutes. I'm just going to get through. I'm just going to get through. And the other one is to, <laughs> excuse me, take deep breaths. There's uh, you've all heard, take a deep breath, right? There's actually a special way of breathing. It's called diaphragmatic breathing. And I teach this to um, people when they're dealing with a lot of issues, but what it is, is you take four to eight seconds in. I tend to take eight because I talk really fast. <laughs> If you talk slower, it can be four, but it's in through your nose and out through your mouth. And when you do that and you breathe in, you want to blow up your belly or your diaphragm like a balloon. When you breathe out, it's like you're breathing out through a straw and you push it out. Do that for a little bit. It will calm you down. It will actually calm your body down, which will be elevated because of the craving. So calming it down is very helpful. When I talked about having medicine available, and how important it is in terms of dealing with withdrawal symptoms, please remember that two weeks of medication can be provided for free by the Wisconsin Tobacco Quit Line. Also know that medications are part of the Affordable Care Act in terms of being first-line treatment for smoking cessation. As such, it should be covered by insurance. Medicaid, Badger Care, and Senior Care all cover the seven FDA approved tobacco cessation medications. This includes all the nicotine replacement therapy, the patch, the gum, lozenge, inhaler, and nasal spray, but it also come, uh, covers propion and varenicline. Excuse me. And should, to be clear, it covers more than med one medication at a time. So when I talked about the patch and the, and the gum or the lozenge at the same time, that covers. To be covered though, this is important. All medications, including those that are over the counter, require a prescription. So talk to your doctor and say, I want to quit, which I'm sure they would love to hear. I need a prescription. And that will get it for free through the insurance uh, property or should because that's how it's covered. You do not need to document counseling on the prescription. In terms of caregivers, these are people, as you know, who commonly live in the home. One thing that makes quitting harder is having another person continue to smoke around you. And it could be a change that if the caregiver smokes, you make together for each other's health. If the caregiver is not willing to quit, see if they might be willing to only smoke away from the person where they're supporting. That may be outside. And it may include moving things like ashtrays, lighters, and other cigarettes out of the home. One of the greatest fears we have beyond all the negative health effects of smoking, as we discussed today, 
is the risk of fire from a lit cigarette in someone who's cognitive, cognitively declining. They may forget that they're smoking and burn themselves or start a fire. So we want to be very clear. There's, of course, cognitive effects, overall health effects, but there are very real danger effects of smoking in adults who are cognitively declining. And as always, try, try again. It takes multiple quit attempts to succeed. And growing research says it's actually common to be more than seven to 10, which is what we used to say. It takes seven attempts to quit. So what I say is stick with it, stick with whoever you're helping and encourage them. Their body and their brain will thank them. All right, I'm just going to go over a little bit of uh, research that I'm doing now and next steps before I just open it up for questions. So I want to highlight uh, what I see as next steps and what I'm currently working on. We already talked about uh, e-cigarettes and a desire I definitely have to look at the cognitive effects of e-cigarettes. Um, but the other piece that I'm really passionate about is motivating older smokers to make quit attempts more often and to make sure they're not just going at it cold turkey. So giving them access to evidence-based care and making sure they can get it. Are we advertising in ways that are relevant and reachable to older adults who smoke? The uh, tips from former smokers campaign, which you may have heard of, has shown really great success, but it's unfortunately been less successful in motivating older adults versus younger adults to quit. And that may be because the messages developed for this campaign were conducted on and targeted for adults younger than the age of 54. So this is the area of work that I'm currently engaging in and what I'm funded for and looking at potential motivational impact of the link between dementia and smoking in older adults is really an in of interest to me. We know that dementia is the greatest uh, fear, excuse me, greatest aging related fear of older adults, but this message is unfortunately not widely disseminated. We also want to build a motivational message that provides clear access routes to evidence-based treatment within a healthcare system and outside of it. We just completed developing some messages after talking with older adults who are smoking, and we'll soon be testing which of those messages are the most preferred and influential in terms of motivating that. So that's upcoming research. If you are a smoker yourself in between the ages of 50 or 80 or know someone who is, we'll soon be recruiting for that. Um, and then the other area of work I'm doing is to develop a culturally specific message for older adult African-American smokers. And this is particularly important because African-Americans who smoke are not only more likely to be diagnosed with dementia, but they're also disproportionately more likely to suffer from the negative health effects from smoking. And there's evidence suggesting that they're less likely to be offered evidence-based treatment or advice to quit by healthcare professionals. We know that culturally specific interventions for African-Americans who smoke have shown promising results. And we really wanna develop that to make sure that we're helping everyone we can. So as I work on developing and testing these motivational messages, um, I wanna highlight the need for more evidence to establish that direct relation between smoking and dementia. I highlighted how smoking increases a lot of risk factors for dementia, and we know that that uh, affects dementia risk. But there's more research needed using those quasi-experimental methods. And hopefully by developing a message that can motivate older adults to quit and by to stay quit by using evidence-based treatment, we can evaluate that longitudinal effect of quitting smoking on brain health and mild cognitive impairment more specifically. So with that, I just want to thank everyone for listening so much today. I've got my e personal email here, as well as uh, our website for ctri.wis.edu. It's got a lot of free trainings and smoking cessation. And I also included the link for smokefree.gov for adults ages 60 and older. A lot of the practical tools I introduced today are there as well, and they give a lot more detail. And they have some downloadable handouts and other tools. And then last but not least, the quit line. 1-800-QUIT-NOW. You can call this number in any state and you will be directed to your local state quit line. So it's relevant outside of Wisconsin, of course. Okay. So with that, are there any questions any of you have? Um, we have uh, somebody, who, uh, a couple of people who have put in here uh, that the information has been incredibly helpful and it's been an excellent presentation. And I want to echo those sentiments as well. Um, this was really, really um, great information with, with solid ways to apply it to 
somebody's daily life, if this is something that they are uh, really challenged to kind of get a handle yeah. on and, and want to be able to, to quit. So thank you for, for being so comprehensive in your presentation. <laughs> You're so welcome. Thank you all for joining. Um, please feel free to put questions in our chat as you have them. Um, we've got uh, plenty of time here for some, some Q&A. Um, we have somebody, uh, Anne has shared, thank you, very good information. Good to have a reference for planning with patients. So again, some additional positive reinforcement. That's great, thank you guys. Um, I wanna bring Dr. Chin into the fold here as we, as we do some Q&A time with, with our um, audience today. Dr. Chin, is there anything you um, wanna, wanna say or kind of recap what Dr. Johnson has been sharing with us today? Yeah, thank you, Jen. Um, and thank you, Dr. Johnson, for that very thorough, but uh, I would say fun kind of talk. I, I appreciated the demonstrations Thanks. in particular. Um, I'm struck by the fact that the body is so capable of healing itself. So you're yes. that one slide in particular, um, where, you know, after 10 years, after 15 years, frankly, after a day, all the things that our body can do when it's not being bombarded by a toxin from yes. a, like cigarette. I find it interesting to, that the risk of stroke returns to normal. And I forget if it was five years or 10 years. It's uh, a great question. It, I can't remember it was, if it was 10. I think it's 10. It, but then yes. the risk of heart disease takes longer. Mm -hmm. And that makes me wonder though, and you know, there are smaller blood vessels in the brain, but to me, looking at things like cognition and dementia, the brain specific, it, it brings me more hope that what you're showing in your studies makes more sense that it's more recent. So you can quit and it doesn't, you don't have to wait 20 years in order to have a benefit to your exactly. brain. I mean, just the risk of stroke alone, which is a pretty significant brain vascular event. Is yes. shorter than for heart disease. So, I mean, sad for the cardiologists yeah. and our hearts, but good for yes. our, our brains. Good for our brain. Well, I think that's a great point. Um, and I think that the, I mentioned there was one existing uh, experimental type research study that looked at cognitive effects and they, even within two years of quitting, found a change in tested cognitive functioning, a significant change. And I think that's, that's even more hopeful in we as um, doctors, uh, me as a PhD, you as an MD who work in this dementia field, really like to focus on our biological bases. It's just interesting. And I think sometimes we forget about the functioning side. Um, and it's just so nice to hear that it, within as little as two years, you can see significant differences. And I would imagine potentially sooner in what do you as a person experience? Maybe it won't come up on the tests I take when I do those funny building block or neuropsych tests, but highlighting that because two years, just to be honest, we've been in a pandemic for two years. Two years goes by pretty fast. <laughs> so let's, um, let's keep that in mind. But yes, I, I'm glad you noticed that. And then the other thing that I thought was important, especially with our healthy living series that we do is this idea of when it comes to quitting, and I think uh, quitting smoking has got to be one of the hardest things possible for a person. Mm -hmm. it, it isn't just, oh, I'm going to stop. One, you want to have, you want to take advantage of the technology and the tools that we have, both medications and non, but then also your other health habits. So one of the things you mentioned was not drinking, which I hadn't considered, but that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, yep. But then I, when I go online and I look at, you know, different techniques to talk to patients about for quitting, so many of them say eating well and sleeping well and being physically active. And that's this whole idea of multimodal. You want to be in the best physical, mental state possible mm -hmm. when you go through what is a very difficult habit change. Exactly. And that's such a good point. Um, a lot of people, just a kind of side note, a lot of people when they are about to quit smoking are concerned about weight gain because um, again, nicotine being a stimulant, stimulant uh, modulates your weight. And one of the things I highlight is you might experience a slight increase in weight within that um, initial period, very slight. But the biggest issue is don't substitute your smoking with nachos. 
or something else. Make those other healthy choices. And I and I really want to highlight it's easy to do. I I mentioned nachos because I personally love them. But it's important to plan for that and to know that hand mouth fixation is something that can really be um, fixed with sugar free gum or carrots or other things or straws. Some people just want to do that. But to highlight the impact on sleep, unfortunately, nicotine infects your sleep in a negative way. I've had many patients who I see for insomnia and I say, oh, you're smoking. When's your last one? Oh, at midnight, right before I go to bed. Uh Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Well, I'm not too surprised that you're struggling with that first part. And (laughs) then you may be waking in the middle of the night because of a drop in your nicotine levels and you want to get up to bump it back up. So it affects all different areas of health. And I fully agree that the importance of changing this multimodal intervention, changing your overall health when you're doing something as hard as changing smoking, doable, but yes, hard, is a great opportunity to really make big changes and changes that will help your overall body, your quality of life, but your brain, your thinking. And that's what we know. And I was got Bonnie here. I was going to say uh, from like my personal experience, I've, I've quit well once for just shy of two years. And then I, I started again, but when I stopped that first time, I lost almost 60 pounds because my lungs felt so good. I just kept moving. Right. Like mm-hmm. if I like sat still, I just think about it. So I rode my bike all the time and I hadn't rode my bike in like 10 years. I, you know, started to do all these, these things um, that were helpful but then I started again. Um, but this last time, um, I, I did not lose any weight the, the last, this last time that I stopped smoking. But for me, I had to get in a new routine because I would go to the, um, I would stop at the gas station like every other day mm-hmm. to smokes. And I was so yeah. going to the gas station that it was just like second nature. And these people were my friends, right? Cause like, yeah. Hey, you know, get my coffee, get my cigarettes. Yes. And- um, you know, that took a lot to come up with a plan of, okay, I'm not going. Cause if I go there, I'm going to get the muffin, you know, and I don't yeah the muffin. And so it was a, a lot in the morning and I had to come up with a plan and I would call, I had different friends I could call in the morning. So I talked to them as I was like going out the door just to see how they were doing. Yeah. Um, and I chewed on toothpicks, like teach mm-hmm. toothpicks. I would just, yep. I couldn't have them like in my professional setting, but when I needed to, like, I would just step aside or, you know, and uh, do yeah. distract myself. Yeah. And I'm so glad you brought up the, the gas station situation. That's so common, Bonnie. Um, and, and hopefully I know you mentioned the quit line that your coach helped you make that plan. Cause that is a big yeah. part of what we do is to really highlight what is part of your ingrained day to day. And Although you may not realize that that's associated with smoking, you may find, oh, well, that's why I actually stop two times a week because I don't need gas that much, but that's where I go to get my cigarettes. So we tell people have a different ride home for the first couple of weeks, go to a different gas station, particularly if you're also like, well, I'll just get a muffin instead. Yep. Maybe don't go to that gas station, <laughs> but prep beforehand, I've had people who make themselves meals beforehand because they're just like, I just don't want to be thinking about it when I'm frustrated and I get it. I, I, it is not the same, but changing all health behaviors can be difficult. And for example, I'm trying to eat healthier, right? A lot of people are, especially with the new year and making that meal before I go to work makes a big difference in how likely I am to have a donut. <laughs> and I think that planning is really key, but also know you're going to have surprises life is full of them and getting your kind of safety net in that surprise is the medication is the, I'm going to use the lozenge. I'm going to use the patch and it could just be, I'm going to leave this situation. If I go to an event and somehow people are smoking, I'm like, I didn't plan for this. Just go, just go and come back in like 20 minutes. They'll be done. So then you can move on to something else. Yeah, and I, I uh, um, live with a smoker and uh, they smoke outside, but um, every once in a while, it usually smells awful to me and I feel sick and I can't handle smelling it. And um, you know, they only smoke in their vehicle. So if we take longer drives, um, we take their vehicle and then I roll my window down, you know, but mm-hmm. there are times where I'm like, oh, that smells so good. You know, it doesn't happen often, but it's like, that but it still happens all night. And 
in in that like three to five minutes, it feels so intense, like I should do this. And then I'm like, no, I have to like play the tape through, right? Like this is not what yep. I to do. I've worked really hard to get here. Um, yep. but you're right. The uh, coach I worked with from the quit line helped me come up with the plan for everything. Like had me take this notebook. I wrote everything out of every situation that I didn't think of was a pattern around smoking. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad you had such a good experience with the quit line. We're really, we at uh, CTRI, some of our staff, well, we help facilitate it and it's, it's state run, but it's been so helpful for a lot of people. So we're really happy that that is a tool that can be used in Wisconsin, but again, nationally, each state has its own quit line. So Dr. Dempsey, we have a question that came through. Um, and the question is what training for, for coaches and coaching do you provide? In terms of smoking cessation, I assume? Mm -hmm. That's what I'm thinking. Um, yeah, so if you go to the ctri.wisc.edu, we have, there's a section um, for providers, and we actually have some videos there that we've made. They're a little bit old, and I don't want to hurt anyone's feeling who's in the video a little bit cheesy, but they're good in terms of, they have really good information, and they kind of act out different people, different things, excuse me. So it actually says for clinicians, and I'm not sure if I pull this here, can you guys see this? Or is it just the PowerPoint? Yeah, I thought that might be the case. If you're talking about my screen sharing difficulties. <laughs> so if you go to the CTRI uh, website, uh, CTRI, and there's a clinician's pull down and it says um, there's clinician training. So we have free clinician training and technical assist uh, assistance. We have free webinars that are available online. We actually have an outreach team and that's headed by um, Rob Adsit, who's here at our uh, office in Madison, but we have people in different areas of Wisconsin and they, their job is to provide training on how to help people quit. So they are really, really good and do this all the time. In terms of my demonstration, I mentioned I was a little bit rusty. That's what they do. And they work in health systems. They go to, um, with the pandemic, it's been a little different. A lot of it's virtual, but um, there's a lot of existing webinars, but a lot of opportunities to sign up for training. Um, and some of them, you can also get CME credits online by completing one of the trainings. So I encourage you to go there. We are very proud and have worked very hard to build that structure um, into our uh, overall center. Great, thank you. And I'll go ahead and make sure that um, all the information on this slide is in the follow-up email we'll send everyone so you can have Great. Uh, direct access to just be able to click and explore more. Awesome, thank you. Okay, well, we don't have any additional questions yet, um, but, but we've got, time. So if people have questions, feel free to talk about them. Um, Dr. Jensen, one of the things I was thinking about is, you know, like this, you know, there's kind of strength in numbers, you know, and, and, and knowing this is something that somebody would like to do and that um, it's hard to do that alone. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things that was coming to mind was, um, in addition to these healthy living with MCI classes, we the association offers um, a connection to a, a seven week uh, education program called Living Well with Chronic Conditions. And in that program, we teach people how to use action plans. And oh, great. So as you were talking about this planning ahead, um, you know, thought process, you know, like, mm -hmm. you know, maybe someone would find benefit in taking that, that particular class because yep. it helps people, you know, break down something that feels big in, yes. into something much more manageable. So, yes. you know, okay, maybe, maybe my action plan for this week is, you know, talking to my healthcare provider, scheduling a time to talk with my healthcare provider about, yes. about, uh, 
cessation of smoking and, and setting a quit date. So it's not actually the, the actual quitting of the smoking, but setting the stage so mm -hmm. that a person would be as successful as possible. And the other yes. thing that that does is it provides, you know, some accountability that is helpful in anything that we're trying to change in our lifestyle, you know, whether it's, you know, losing weight or increasing physical activity or, you know, changing our, our nutrition. There's all sorts of different ways that doing that in community with other people can be successful. Um, and so there's also this component of problem solving that happens. So when you come back each week and, you know, you kind of go around the group and talk about how did you do with your action plan? And for everybody, it's different. Mm -hmm. You know, there might be an area where somebody would get stuck. And, and so there's this kind of group brainstorming on, on how to, how to deal with that. Um, yeah. and then this other idea of what do you fill that space with? Mm -hmm. um, you know, a class like that really does help address some of those other, those multimodal things Dr. Chin was talking about with, you know, it, maybe it turns out that I don't just want to work on smoking, but there's other things that I want to work on as well. And so it kind of does this more uh, global sort of overall assessment of our own health, right? Yeah. Um, that sounds like a wonderful course. I, yeah. as a health psychologist, I am fully on board. Like that is great. So, <laughs> yeah, and I think in connection with folks who are all living with, you know, mild cognitive impairment or an early stage dementia of some sort, that there's, you know, this commonality that maybe there are a few ways that things have to be adjusted a little bit differently. But there yes. are people in your corner. To help and and just knowing I've learned so much today from there's places we can all connect people that maybe I didn't know about in the past so so thank you for that so you know just this idea of looking in these different places for additional support might be really helpful definitely I love that idea and I think you're highlighting what I've found in working in this field uh, the Alzheimer's dementia cognition field more recently, because my background, as you can probably guess, is in tobacco, um, there are so many resources that we don't all know about. And the more that we can connect them and collaborate, the more that hopefully the people who need them will be able to get some hint of what they need. And then once they're in, they'll start mm -hmm. to see, hey, there's actually a bouquet. Right. But I think that um, you're really highlighting some of the great, great tools that are, are already out there. And hopefully we can just keep adding to those and, and spreading the word is really the big issue, getting mm -hmm. the information to people who don't know. Wonderful. Would it be helpful to, to, to shift to the, um, to the upcoming events now that you're addressing? Yeah, why don't we do that? So um, we have five more uh, programs through our Healthy Living with MCI uh, a speaker series that will be happening this year. And, and so um, keep an eye out for more information about those dates and those topics as they come available. And then the additional information about that Living Well with Chronic Conditions workshop, the association, this is an evidence-based program that is taught um, throughout Wisconsin, throughout the United States. It's a, it's a very, um, uh, accessible program. The Alzheimer's Association specifically um, works with folks who are living with mild cognitive impairment in early stage dementia of some sort. And then we encourage their care partner to join in the class as well. We find that it, it actually um, improves communication. Uh, it really focuses on areas of strength um, and, and, and really provides this seven week kind of shelter <laughs> to really get a handle on something that somebody might want to be working on and then, um, you know, move it from just an idea into uh, an action plan that turns into something that becomes a habit. Um, so we have four workshops coming up this year. They'll all be virtual. Um, so the first one will start up in February. And then we have another uh, spring workshop in April and then a fall one in October. So uh, we'll have information in a later slide on how to connect 
with us should that be something that um, our, uh, our audience might be interested in this year. And then Dr. Chen, do you wanna talk about your Dementia Matters podcast? And Sure can, Jen. So uh, the ADRC and UW, we have a podcast, which really consists of probably 10 to 20 minute episodes that are released uh, to every month. So almost every other week uh, where I am interviewing researchers like Dr. Johnson, who's on the podcast, uh, both locally here at UW, but also uh, really nationally um, looking at, at research on cognition, on uh, Alzheimer's disease or dementia. Uh, I also interview um, people from the community who are looking at caregiver support um, as well. And so it's, uh, it's a way to really translate what's happening in, in science as well as in the community uh, to the general audience uh, in, in short bites so that we can actually appreciate the information and hopefully do something positive uh, with it. And so you see the link on the screen. Um, you can also just go to any of your own podcasting apps if you have one uh, and find it that way. Uh, but I encourage you to, to scroll through. We have a lot of episodes now. We have over 100 um, and on many different topics. But if anyone in this group has a specific topic that is missing that they notice, uh, please reach out to me or Bonnie uh, or our general ADRC email as we, we do listen to those and we, we try to get as many speakers as we can. I've listened to several of them myself, Dr. Chen. They are, they are wonderful. And I love that you can go back and, and listen to some past um, conversations that you've had. So thank you for, yeah. for having those available to our community. Thank you, Jen. I, I, I expect, Jen, you, you are going to listen to all of them, though. So I need those downloads because we do keep track of those. Okay, so okay. I, I will going. get that going. You bet. <laughs> What's on our next slide? Uh, yeah, so we have ways to stay connected to the um, Alzheimer's Disease Research Center and to the Alzheimer's Association. Uh, we each have newsletters. Uh, they are they are both really, really well done. So uh, to stay informed and in the loop, uh, these are the links to go on and subscribe and um, learn more about not just this particular series, but all the different things that are happening um, within the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center and the Alzheimer's Association. Is there another slide, Bonnie? Yep. And then uh, there are ways to stay connected to us through social media, through Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube as well. So uh, there's no one avenue, there's multiple ways to, to get information about each of these organizations. Bonnie, do you, are, would you be comfortable talking about the research component? Yeah, definitely. So. Um, if you happen to be interested in learning more about our research and potentially being a research participant at the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, you can um, go to the website listed here. I'll also go ahead and put that link in the email I'll send out. And you'll talk to myself or my colleague, Kelsey, and um, we'll share some more information and see if there's a study that you might be a fit for. And if I can add to that, we do also have two ongoing research studies at the Center for Tobacco Research Intervention that would provide you with free treatment as well as payment for participating in research to help you quit smoking. So if that's something after today you really want to do, um, feel free again to go to the CTRI website. 